take your Bibles. I know you may be at home and you may feel a little self-conscious doing this, but lift up your Bibles and repeat after me. I believe this is the Word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. Well, I want to tell you a little bit about Israel, first of all. On the coastal plain of Israel, uh, today there is a city called Tel Aviv. And in modern Israel, it's a, it's a beautiful city out on the coastal plain. But if you go a little bit east, you're going to find a mountain range. And in this mountain range that goes from north to south in Israel uh, are most of the, the cities that are what we would call our Bible cities. Uh, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, and, and there's many others. And between this mountain range and the coastal plain, uh, there's, there's a little area down through there and uh, it's a series of valleys. And it's called the Shefla. And this series of valleys uh, is one of the most beautiful places in Israel. There are uh, orchards, there's vineyards, wheat fields. And uh, interestingly, in ancient times, this was the area that the armies that would try to come against Israel, they would, they would land out on the coastal area or they lived there, and they would move across these valleys toward the mountains, and they would want to go up and conquer the mountains. And in these ancient times, uh, let's say uh, 1,000 to to 1,200 years before Jesus, uh, the coastal plain is where the Philistines lived. Now, the Philistines were uh, the arch enemies of, of Israel. They hated Israel, and one time, uh, about approximately 1,200 years before Jesus was born, the Philistines decided that they were going to come across uh, from the coastal plains. They were going to go through the, this valley area, and they were going to go to the mountains, and they were going to conquer an area around Bethlehem, which would separate the northern and southern part of Israel. And by doing this, they, they felt this was a good strategic way of attacking Israel. So the Philistines got their army together and they started moving across and they were, they were out in this area of the valleys headed toward uh, the mountainous area. But King Saul, he was the king, he heard about this. <clears throat> and so he gathered the army of Israel together and they went down there to stop the Philistines. And what they did is they basically on the north side of one of the areas, uh, kind of on a hillside, the uh, Israelites all lined up with their battle array. And on the southern side, uh, on, a, on a hill, and when we say mountains, it's kind of funny. When we say mountains here in the United States, you're thinking of Pikes Peak or Mount Everest. When they say mountains over in Israel, uh, to a degree, they're almost talking about the hills of the Ozarks. You know, they're, they're not quite uh, what we would think of as mountains, but they, they were up uh, the Philistines were up on the range on the south and uh, the Israelites were up on the range on the north and there was this big flat area in between and uh, they had been there for quite some time for several weeks and I think that it's interesting I think, I think what I'm going to do now is we're just going to read this story out of the Bible and uh, I think you'll get a good clear picture. Nothing can say anything any better than the Word can say it. So we're just going to go straight to the Word. Find Samuel, all right, chapter 17, and uh, I will go ahead and get my Bible open here also. And uh, now, 1 Samuel, chapter 17, <clears throat> And let's start with verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered their army together to battle and were gathered at Succah, which belongs to Judah. They encamped between Succah and Azka. Is that how you say that, Amos? Azka? Oh. Uh, uh, say it again. Azekah, that's the way you say it? 
Well, we could say, as a king, ha ha. <laughs> but at any rate, take a look at verse 2. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they camped in the valley of Elah, and they drew up in battle array against the Philistines. So you got to get this picture. The Israelites had shown up. The Philistines had shown up. They're in their battle array. That means they've got all their, their, their weapons. They've got their banners. Uh, they've got their trumpeteers. I mean, they're, they're ready to fight. Verse 3. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Goth, whose height was six cubits and a span. He was a giant. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was five thousand shekels of bronze. He had a bronze he had bronze armor on his leg and bronze javelin between his shoulders. And now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed six hundred shekels, and a shield bearer went before him. Now you gotta get this picture. This guy was huge. It's estimated that his, his armor that he wore all by itself was over 100 pounds. Just, just his armor. And the spearhead, now, now think about this, the spearhead weighed 15 to 16 pounds. That's the size of a man's bowling ball. Now if you can imagine having a spear and having a bowling ball out on the end of it, this guy was so big and so strong that he just held it in a normal fashion. Now, I, I will tell you one thing, that uh, the armies of this time had three basic groups. They had their infantry, they had their cavalry, and they had their archers and slingers. Now, the Infantry was your foot soldiers. That was the guys like Goliath. I mean, they, they were the guys that were dressed up in their armor. They had shields, spears, swords, and they went out and did hand-to-hand -hand combat. The cavalry, they rode on horses or whatever animal that that particular country used. You know, if it was certain places in the world, it might be camels. But, but uh, like the Roman soldiers, rode horses. And then they had the uh, snipers, and the snipers were the uh, archers and the slingers. Now keep this in mind, Goliath went out and he was what? He was, he was in the infantry. So let's take a look at what happened here. So he's standing out there and he stood, verse 8, then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, why have you come out <clears throat> to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves, and let him come down to me. And if he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Now, it was the custom and tradition of this day that when armies would come together, there were times when to prevent bloodshed, they would have a single man fight. And they would take the greatest warrior from one group and the greatest warrior from another group, and they would come out and they would battle. And the one that won, it would be a victory for his army. And they were supposed to, the other side, surrender. They didn't always surrender but they were supposed to. And so this is basically what Goliath is doing. He is walking down and he is saying, I defy you, send out your best soldier and we'll fight. We'll just have a one man battle here. And if I win, you'll be our servants. If you win, we'll be your servants. Verse 11, when Saul, and he was the king of Israel, and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine. They were dismayed, 
and greatly afraid. You know, we read that phrase, greatly afraid. Now, these guys were scared out of their wits because they knew that they had nobody, no infantrymen that could go out there and equal Goliath. Verse 12, now David was the son of an Ephraimite of Bethlehem, Judea, whose name was Jesse, and who had eight sons, and the man was old, advanced in years, in the days of Saul. Now the oldest of these sons of Jesse had begun to follow Saul into battle. The names of his three sons who went into battle were Eliab, the firstborn, next to him Abinadab, and the third was Shema. David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed Saul. Now, the Bible doesn't give us the exact age of David. It's estimated by most, most scholars that he was around 17, but they almost all agree that he was somewhere between 16 and 20. Now, he was the youngest, so his brothers were probably in the ages of 20, 25, 28, 30. They were, they were in the prime of being soldiers. Verse 14, David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed Saul. But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. Now, this is probably a pretty common thing. You had the four boys, the three oldest ones, they went to battle. And the youngest one, somebody's got to take care of dad, Jesse. He was an old man, it says. He was advanced in years. And they had a lot of animals to take care of. Somebody had to go and take care of Jesse, take care of the sheep. And the Philistine, verse 16, and the Philistine drew near and presented himself 40 days, morning and, and evening. So 80 times Goliath showed up and 80 times he bellowed this thing, send out your best infantryman, send out your best soldier and we'll fight. And 80 times the Israelites stood on the hill looking, and the Bible says, greatly afraid. Then Jesse said to his son David, Take now for your brothers an ephah of the dried grain, and these men, this is for cosmetic use only, and these ten loaves, and run to your brothers at the camp. And carry these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousands and see how your brothers fare and bring news back to me. So Jesse, the father, one time when David went home to take care of the sheep and his dad, his dad gave him a bunch of food for the brothers and some of the other guys. And he said, I want you to go out and check it out. Come back and tell me how they're doing. I want to know how my, how my sons are doing in this battle. Now Saul and they, the sons, and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. Now fighting, they weren't really fighting. They were standing there preparing for battle. So David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper, and took the things which, took the things and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to fight and shouting for battle. So it sounds like all they had been doing is shouting. All right? For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array army against army. And David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army, and came and greeted his brothers. Then, as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Goth, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words, so David heard him. So Goliath came out, and he once again proclaims that he's, he wants somebody to come out and fight with him. But this time, David was there, and he heard it. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him, for they were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king, 
will enrich with great riches and will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Then David spoke to the men who stood by, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. So Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said. So here's, here's what happened. David's talking, and he's finding out that whoever kills this giant is going to have free taxes for his family for the rest of his life, plus he's going to get the king's daughter, and evidently she must have really looked hot. Because if she wasn't, who would want to? Never mind. So David, he makes this proclamation. He says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Who is this Gentile that he can defy God? He can defy the armies of the living God. Who is this guy? And his brother, his older brother heard him say that. And he kind of got a little angry. It goes on to say, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down here to see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? Is there not a cause? Then he turned from him toward another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first one did. Now the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and Saul sent for him. Somehow, when David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? People started saying, yeah, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? And word got back to the king, and the king says, who started that? They said, well, this guy out here. He said, bring him here. Then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant, he's referring to himself, your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. You are a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant, referring to himself, used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it, and I struck it, and I delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it rose against me, I caught it by its beard, and I struck and killed it. Your servant, me, this kid, the youth, has killed both a lion and a bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them seeing that he has defied the armies of the living God. <laughs> Moreover, David said, the Lord, and notice there, it's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. It's yud heh vav -Hey. The unspoken, unpronounceable name of God. Evidently, David spoke it. Because it says here, and the Lord, who delivered me from the paw of the lion... And from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hands of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. So Saul clothed David with his armor. Now Saul was not a regular-sized man himself. The Bible tells us he was head and shoulders above everybody else. So he's, he's got this armor for somebody that's head and shoulders above all the other soldiers. And he takes his armor, and he puts it on David. <clears throat> so Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put a bronze helmet on his head, and he clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested it. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these. 
for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Then he took his staff. It's a wooden stick. He took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook. And he put them in a shepherd's bag, in a pouch, which he had in his sling that was in his hand. And he drew near to the Philistine. I want to show you something in a few moments about those rocks. Now verse 41. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, and the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good-looking. He must have been a pastor. <clears throat> So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Goliath thought it was an insult that they sent a young kid out there to fight him. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day the Lord, yud heh vav -Hey, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with a sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into my hands, into our hands. Verse 48. So it was when the Philistine rose and came and drew near to David, and David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag, and he took out a stone. And he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead, so that the stone sank into his forehead. And he fell on his face on the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword, the sword of the Philistine, and drew it out of the sheep and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And that's what's going to happen with the enemy who has this great attack on our nation right now. When he sees that his champion is dead, he's going to flee. Now, the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted. This time they didn't just shout and sit back down. They shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell on the road, even as far as Gath and Ekron. Then the children of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines and plundered their tents. See, keep in mind, when these people went to battle during this time of history, they took all their valuables with them. They took their valuables with them. So the Israelites gathered together all the spoils. Verse 54, And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. But he put his armor in his tent. Verse 55. When Saul saw David going out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As your soul lives, O king, I don't have a clue. Verse 56. So the king said, Inquire whose son this young man is. Then as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. 
And Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? So David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse. Now here's the in interesting thing about this. We, we have this Bible story. We read it. But I don't think we see it as clear as it really is. One thing we need to understand, you, you've heard of uh, in Israel, in the Bible it talks about Golgotha. That's the hill of the skull. You know why they called it the hill of the skull? I, I've been there several times, and uh, Loretta, in fact, has been several times. Just this year she was out uh, in the area where David and Goliath had their battle. But uh, Golgotha, right below it, this hill is an, an Arab bus station. But if you back up and look at this hill, the side of the hill looks like a skull. You can, you can actually see the, the, the cave's imprint where eyes would be and the, and the nose like a skull. But that's not the reason they call this Golgotha. They call it Golgotha because David, after this battle, David carried Goliath's head with him wherever he went. Now, I know, you know, we, we don't do that too much in today's society. But he carried that head with him wherever he went. And finally, evidently, he got tired of carrying it. And so they put a pole out there on top of this mountain. And he put Goliath's head on top of the pole. And that's why they called it Golgotha, the hill of the skull. That's where Goliath's head was. Well, I'm sure that uh, it's a bit of information you may have not needed. But... Uh, now, when we read this story of David, we see David as the underdog. But I need you to understand something. When the world looks at us, they see the body of Christ as the underdog. They see us as a bunch of Bible thumpers that really didn't know anything. But the truth is, the truth is, we are not the underdogs. We are the ones who have been given authority and power by the one who created the universe to take our slingshot and propel our stones, which are words, and we can change the world, we can conquer the world with our words. We need to not be in fear like the Israelites. One of the, one of the key things about David, he was not in fear. In fact, when, when he saw Goliath, and you've heard this phrase before, everybody else was saying he's too big to hit. It's like David looked at him and said, he's too big to miss. You know, he, he is, he's an uncircumcised Philistine, Philistine who's coming against the armies of God. And he can't do that. God has promised us the victory. And that's what we're in right now. We, we've got a giant that's come against us. But the Bible tells us that we don't go by what we see. We go by what God says. And what does God say? I give you authority over all the power of the enemy. And nothing, no thing by any means shall harm you. He tells us life and death are in the power of the tongue. He's, Jesus said, by your words you'll be justified. And by your words you'll be condemned. We could almost say it this way. By your words you'll either be victorious or you'll lose. It's important. But see, everybody saw David as an underdog. Everybody sees us as an underdog. Many of the newscasters make fun of our president and vice president because they pray. They make fun of them because they read the Bible. When in reality, Goliath made fun of David because all he had was a sling. When in reality, the sling was his victory. The stone, the little stone he picked up was nothing compared to the sword and the shield and hundred pounds of armor and that spearhead nothing just it was just a stone but in that stone was the victory well why did they think that uh, David was inferior well first of all he was just a kid and Goliath was an experienced warrior and see the the enemy that comes against us even this virus that's come against our nation they have computer models, and they say, this is what it's going to do. You know, this many hundreds of thousands of people are going to die. And when the enemy 
proclaims death, as we've discussed many times, there is no power in the words of Satan whatsoever. He has no power in his words unless he can get us as speaking spirits to say what he says. And so as speaking spirits, we shouldn't say, well, there's going to be 100, 200, 300,000 people die. How do we know that? Well, that's what the computer model said, and that's what the person said on constant negative news. You know, that's what they said. And, uh, well, don't say that. That's, that's like the soldiers on the hillside saying, we're going to die. That's a giant out there. Nobody can meet him. They were greatly afraid because nobody could match him. But what it took was one person, one young man, to say, this, you, you guys are looking at the way things are. I'm looking at things through God's eyes. Through God's eyes, we are victorious. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he thinks he can come against us? We don't go by what we see. What we see is an enemy out there that's, that's huge. It doesn't matter what we see. We still have common sense. I mean, David didn't go out there without his sling. David didn't just say, well, you know, I, my God will protect me. And he just walks out there and stands there and lets the enemy. At the, no, he was led by the Holy Spirit and he took the weapon that the Lord had given him. What's the weapon we've been given? What we say will come to pass if we believe it and if we speak what God says. Hmm. Well, Goliath, Goliath had armor. David just had his sling. But do you remember when I told you that in the ancient armies there were three groups? There was the infantry. That's what Goliath was. Hand-to-hand -hand combat. There was the cavalry, they rode on the horses. And there were the snipers. That was the archers and the slingers. Historically, you'll find that many of the battles during this time, during this two, three hundred year period, many of the battles that were won were won because of the slingers. Let me tell you what history tells us about the slingers in the armies during this time. David's slingshot was not a slingshot like what you would go down and buy for your grandchild at Walmart for Christmas. It was not one of those little things with a handle where you put a, a marble in it and you pull it back and you try to aim it and you let go. That's not what it was. It was, it was a cloth pouch, a leather pouch, with two straps on it. And it was a weapon used by experienced snipers. It's uh, estimated that the slowest that the projectile would travel from one of these slingers was 100 miles an hour. That's faster than a major league pitcher can pitch a baseball. Let me tell you something else about this. The rocks in that valley were barium sulfate. And for those of you who are chemists or rock experts, geologists, you'll know that, is, that rock is twice the density of a normal stone. In other words, they were very hard rocks. It's estimated that the power of David's rock, when it hit the forehead of Goliath, would have been equal to a 45 caliber handgun. There are historical records that talk about how these slingers now, now follow me on this how these slingers could accurately kill an animal at 200 yards how long is a football field 100 yards so at twice the length of a football field these slingers could kill an animal the slingers during this time were so accurate with their slinging that they had contests. The Roman slingers had contests and they would literally try to shoot birds out of the air in flight. These guys were good. 
David was an experienced slinger. He had practiced with his sling. He's killed big animals. He wasn't afraid of lions. He wasn't afraid of bears. He wasn't afraid of things that would come against him because he was an experienced slinger. While he was watching the sheep, I would imagine he practiced over and over and over again. He had target practice. He knew which stones to pick up. He could hit a target. Possibly David could have struck a bird out of the sky. What was Goliath expecting? Goliath was expecting another infantryman. Goliath was a lumbering giant. And he was, he was kind of like a Sumerai warrior, so to speak. He just was big, probably clumsy, but a brute. And probably could kill anything he could get his hands on. But David didn't plan on him getting his hands on him. Instead of God sending down another infantryman, God sent down a sniper, and he wasn't 200 yards away. And when that rock hit Goliath's forehead, something entered into the mind of Goliath that he never, had never been there before. There's several lessons to learn from this. And, and one, of the, one of the biggest lessons is, is God doesn't fight by man's rules. You know, Goliath, he was the one going down there every day. He's the one that set up the idea of saying, hey, bring somebody out. Bring somebody out here. We're going to fight. If I win, we win. You win, you guys win. He's the one that did that. And he did it for 40 days, two times a day. But God didn't do things the way he wanted to do them. See, the battle, as David said, the battle is not ours, it's the Lord's. God's going to give us wisdom on what weapon to use. You don't have to walk up and fight hand-to-hand -hand with the enemy. You don't have to do that. But God will deliver the head of the enemy into your hands. And you will get the spoils of the war. I wonder if it will mean we don't have to pay taxes for the rest of our lives, too. But there's several lessons to learn from this. Uh, probably the first lesson is God's going to call who he wants to call. Now, when the prophet went down to uh, Jesse's house, he, he picked out David, who was the youngest, little freckly-faced who knows how old he was? Let's say he's 15, 17, 18 years old. The other sons, they'd been working out. They'd been planning on going to the army. But the prophet said the anointing's on that one. And that's where that famous verse comes from in the Bible. We take it out of context most of the time. But there's a verse that says, and the prophet said this to Jesse. He said, man looks at the outside but God looks at the heart. You're looking at these sons by who's the strongest, who you think would be the, make the best leader, who, who you think would be the best anointed person. You're looking at the one you think would be best. But let me tell you something. God doesn't look at people the way you look at people. God looks at the heart. You're looking at the outside. God looks at the heart. So I guess when people say things like, well, I, don't, I really don't have the talent, or I don't have this, or I don't have that, God can't use me because of this or what. Now listen, you, you don't have to be, you know, number one. As, as my grandpa used to say, you don't have to be the tallest hog at the trough. You know, you, you, don't, you don't have to be the one that sparkles. No. God picks who God wants to pick. Maybe the youngest, maybe the oldest. So if God's called you to something, don't you say, look, I can't do it. That's an experienced enemy out there. All I've got is a sling. No. God will give you and train you. See, now that's something else too. 
David must have trained. He didn't go out there to battle and say, hey, does anybody have a slingshot I could borrow? No. He had his tested weapon with him. You know the thing that you've been practicing all your life could just be the thing that God's going to use to deliver our nation. God calls who he wants to call. I think that's the first lesson we need to learn. Second lesson we need to learn is right is better than might. Being right with God is better than all the strength that you can muster up on this earth. Goliath had the might. But David was right and had the right. The third thing I think is we need to understand is God prepares us. David was prepared before the battle. Now here's the deal. Nobody else thought he was prepared. But David knew he was prepared. That's why he had no fear. I know that uh, our church is full of a lot of Bible teachers. There's something about going before people and being prepared as to going before people and not being prepared. I used to know a minister a church I attended many years ago. He said, I never study anymore. I don't, I don't study the word anymore. The Bible says God will give you what to say in that hour, and I just believe that the anointing, the Holy Spirit's going to tell me what to say when I walk up to the pulpit. Well, I'd been to a few services where evidently the Holy Spirit didn't tell him what to say. You know, no, we, we prepare. I know myself, I always prepare. Like today, I've got 10, 12, 14, I think 14 pages of notes. Am I going to use them all? Of course not. But I like to be prepared. It's always better to be over-prepared than not prepared. David was prepared. All of those years of practicing with that slingshot paid off. Here's something else I saw from that story. You've got to be yourself. David couldn't be King Saul. I mean, here's the king himself said, wear my hat, wear my armor, take my sword and my shield, Go get him, David. And David put this stuff on, and it, it just wasn't him. It wasn't, that was not his anointing. See, one thing I love about our worship team, and uh, not because they just sang this morning, and some of them are still in the building, but honestly, our worship team is one of the most anointed worship teams I've ever been around in my life. And I'm in my 70s, and I've been preaching for over 50 years, and I've been around about every kind of worship team and ministry thing that you can think of. Some really, really good, and some maybe not so. But our worship team, each and every member on our worship team, they know their gifting. They know who they are. They know what God's called them to do. There's no fighting, bickering, jealousy. Nobody saying, well, give me that part or give me that microphone or let me play that or whatever. No. It, it's Everybody seems to know their anointing. They know, they know their calling, which takes me up to the, to the next thing is you got to know your weapons. You got to know what your weapon is. That's part of knowing what your gifting is. For years, I played bass. I was a worship leader of, of a church one time, and I played bass as a worship leader. But many years before that, I was a member of a musical group. We traveled around quite extensively and did some studio tracks and various things, and I was a keyboardist. I had a keyboard, and this was back in the day when the, when the keys were not black and white. My keys were deep orange. It was, you almost might say it was a, uh, a specialty keyboard. And everybody, every place we'd go and play, I'd set that keyboard up and people would come up and they'd go, oh my goodness, I, oh wow, where'd you get that? But here's what I discovered. That was not my gifting. And it, 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 was, it was never right. It was never right. Even though I loved doing it, 
And even though everybody kind of marveled over my unique keyboard, it just wasn't me. And it never was right. And that, that's the way it is walking in the anointing. If you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, it'll be right. It doesn't matter, like the Bible says, if, if, if it's nothing more than you're the cupbearer for the king's servant. If that's what your calling is and that's, that's where your gifting is, then you will receive the same reward for being in your lane doing what you're supposed to do as the king will get for being in his lane and doing what he's supposed to do. See, it's, it's not about our position on earth. You know, a lot of people, especially in ministry, a lot of people will look at things and they'll say, well, this position's higher than this position. No, there, there are no higher or lower positions. There's just different positions and different callings. And uh, once again, I think that's one of the reasons our worship team works so well. There's such an anointing. I came down here the other night when they were practicing. They didn't even know that, that I came down, and I, I stood over to the side. And you could feel the anointing in the room. That's because the people in the room were doing what God had called them to do. It's, it's a blessing. But you need, to, you need to know your instrument. You need to know your weapon. I'll tell you what, our God is a good God. You know, in this story of David may have happened a long time ago but it's in our Bible for a purpose you know it's it's a good story for children but we need to understand that David was not some weak kneed little puny child with some kind of a toy slingshot that made a lucky shot and just happened to hit Goliath and everybody cheered and and it's just a miraculous story no he was a trained slinger who knew that he knew that he knew his ability and he knew that he knew that he knew that the Lord his God had promised that no uncircumcised Philistine anywhere, anytime could ever take the army of God down and he knew that it didn't matter if it was just him, a 17 year old with a slingshot and the army of the enemy is lined up across the hillside, it, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. God always wins. And in our nation right now, we need to, we need to understand this. We, we may be in a, a time of lockdown. We may be in a time where we're not supposed to congregate. But you know, we are the church. It doesn't change the church. It doesn't change the authority and the power that we've been given. God is still on the throne. And who is this uncircumcised virus that it thinks it can come against the army of God? Who is it? Now, that doesn't mean you can go out there and say, well, I'm just going to touch my face. I'm not going to wash my hands. And I'm going to use the gas pump. And I'm going to go and cough on people. No, no. Be wise, of course. Be wise once again. David didn't just walk out there without his slingshot and say, well, somehow I'm going to win. No, he was led by the Holy Spirit. He did what he was supposed to do. And God, when we do what we're supposed to do, then God does what he says he will do, and the victory is ours. So with that in mind, we're going to receive communion here in just a moment. But I want to remind you, and I have it here someplace in my... 17 pages of notes. Aha, here it is. Oh, thank you, Michaela. You can just bring that over here. This is Michaela from the worship team. Isn't she precious? Thank you, Michaela. Remember this scripture? No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Is this virus a weapon? Yeah, it's a weapon. Who's it formed? formed against it's formed against mankind who who did God love so much that he sent his son for mankind the enemy hates mankind God loves mankind but no weapon formed against us will prosper look at this I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me we've got to know who we are 
Matthew 19, 26. You may say, well, this just looks impossible. It doesn't matter how it looks. Jesus said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Mark 9, 29 says, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. Is it possible we can get through this virus situation unscathed? Yes. Is it possible? Yes. Is it possible for everybody? No. Jesus said, if you, if you can believe, it's possible. Now, don't get judgmental. If somebody that you know has the virus, it doesn't mean they're a sinner. All right? If you know of a family where they've lost a loved one because of the virus, it doesn't mean that they did something wrong. Once again, I'm going to invoke the words of my grandpa who is now in heaven. But he said, when you're standing out there by the fence, looking over at your neighbor's farm equipment, he said, remember this, keep your own plow clean. Quit looking at everybody else's equipment and wondering why they don't clean up that old tractor. No, you keep your own tractor clean. And so don't be looking at other people and judging them. That's, that's between them and God. You don't know everything about them. You don't know what's going on in their life. But let's look at ourselves. If we can believe, say this, I can believe. That makes all things possible. All right. Then 1 John 4, 4. It says that he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. And I like this one. Psalm 91, 7. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. You know, in, in the 91st Psalm, we, I don't know if you've received it, those of you who are home, I don't know if you've received it yet, but we mailed out uh, the 91st Psalm on a card this week. And one of, one of those verses says that he will deliver us from the perilous pestilence. And that pestilence that it's talking about there, look it up in the dictionary. A pestilence is a virus or a sickness or a disease that tries to infect an entire region or country. And that's what we have. A perilous pestilence that's come against us. But what does God say in his word? I will deliver you from the perilous pestilence. 1 John 5, 4. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And then we'll close with this scripture. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart, if we do not give up. Once again, I have this on my refrigerator at home. Not this exact one. I printed out a different one. But this is my uh, daily word confession for victory. And I have these scriptures here. I, I would suggest that you take this list and read it every morning. Read Psalm 91 as a family. I mean, you're at your house. What else do you have to do? You know, so uh, this, this is a good thing. And if you don't have the daily word confession, just email us here at the church. And the, the email address at the church is wow, W-O-W, -W, at Ollison, my last name, O-L-L-I-S-O-N dot org. Just email us and say, I would like to have those scriptures Pastor talked about, and Shelby will send those to you. So let's just take a moment before we, we close today and let's receive communion. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We give you all the honor. We speak the blessing, Father, upon the people who are with us today, wherever they are, scattered around the world. We speak the blessing upon them. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, the Bible says that Jesus took the bread and the cup, and he broke the bread, he blessed it, and he said, this is my body, it's broken for you. Then the Bible tells us that he took the cup in the same manner, and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant this is my blood do this in remembrance of me
praise God. Father, in the name of Jesus, I speak the blessing upon all who are watching today. By your Holy Spirit, reveal to each and every one of them, young and old alike, the magnitude of the anointing that heals our bodies, who restores us, that protects us. We submit ourselves to you, Father. We thank you that you have forgiven us of our sins. We thank you that the blood of Jesus and his stripes have healed us. And we receive the forgiveness. We receive the healing. We receive the blessing and we speak the blessing. In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you.